Hello everyone and welcome back to the 8th episode on how to create your own programming language in Python. Uh, so in this episode we are going to be adding functions and I'm going to show you the result uh, which we will have at the end of this video. So first of all we are going to be able to define functions so we can create a function called add that is going to take in the arguments a and b and it's just going to return a plus b. So as you can see this creates a function called add. We can then call this function with some parameters and so that should give a result of 11. If we put too few parameters, it will create an error. And it is the same thing if we put too many parameters. We can also reassign a function to another variable. So I'm just going to assign a var sum function equals add. And so now if we type in some function, we can still see uh, we have a function here. And although it's in the variable sum function, uh, the name of the function is still add. So we can now call some func. And if we pass in two values, uh, we will still get a result. We can also create anonymous functions without names. And as you can see, it creates a function called anonymous. We can, of course, assign that to a variable. So if we go var sum func equals um, an anonymous function that just adds six to whatever's passed in. And then we can type sum func. And if we put in a value of 12, it will add six and we'll get 18. We also have a nice trace back when we have an error. So I'm just going to create this function that divides by zero. And when we go ahead and call it with any value, uh, you can see this trace back with the error. So it said the error occurred in the test function, as you can see here. And that test function was just called inside the program, but not in any specific function. Okay, so now we're going to get started with implementing functions. So we'll start by updating the lexer. So we're going to need a few new token types, and those are going to be the comma token and the arrow token. We are also going to need to add in a new fun keyword for defining functions. So we'll head down to the lexer and we'll add in the checks for these new token types. Uh, so we'll start with the comma token. So we'll just copy and paste in one of the others and we will change this to comma and change the token type to comma as well. The arrow token is a slight bit more complicated because the arrow is a dash and an arrow. And we also have a minus token in our language. So we have to generate either of these in the same method. So depending on whether there's an arrow after the minus, it changes whether we have an arrow token or a minus token. So we'll come up to uh, the minus token here and we'll get rid of this code and instead we will create another function. So this function is going to be called make minus our arrow and we'll also append that to our list of tokens. So we'll add in make minus our arrow down here. So we'll start by creating a token type variable and this is going to be minus at the start. Uh, but if we come across an arrow, we will then change that to the arrow token type. We will also need to get the position start, uh, which we also have in every other method. And when this method is called, we've already come across a minus character, so we can just go ahead and advance. And now we want to check if the character afterwards is equal to an arrow. So we'll advance and if this is the case, we just want to change the token type uh, to an arrow token type. So all we have to do now is return a new token with that token type, followed by the position start and position end. So that should be all the changes we need to make for the lexer. So the next thing we have to do is update the grammar rules of our language. So we'll start by adding a function definition rule and we're going to put this inside the atom. So we'll put in function definition and we'll define that down here. So as you've seen at the start of the video, this is going to start with a fun keyword. We'll then have an optional identifier for the name, and I put in question mark here, which means optional. We then want a left and right parentheses, and in between here, we will optionally have some arguments. So that's what the question mark here means again. So for the arguments, we'll have an identifier, and then we'll have zero or more, which is what this asterisk means, uh, commas, and another identifier. So this means if we do have any arguments, we start with the identifier for the argument name, and then for every argument after that, we need a comma before the next identifier. So finally then after that we need an arrow and then the expression which is evaluated when the function is called. So next we need to add in a call rule which will allow us to call an expression by adding parentheses. So we're going to add this rule in between power and atom. So we'll call this call. And in the power rule we now want to change this from atom to call so that it moves to the next rule in the list. And then call is going to look for the atom rule. So from what we have here everything would work the same as before. So now we want the ability to be able to call the atom using parentheses. So everything in between these parentheses will be optional. So we'll add in a left parentheses and a right parentheses. And calling is almost the same as the definition. So we're just going to copy this. Uh, but instead of passing in identifiers when we're calling a function, we just want to pass in expressions. 
And so if we do get a left parenthesis and right parenthesis, then we call this atom, uh, but if not, we just get the value of the atom. So that should be it for the grammar rules, so we can now move on to updating the parser. So we'll start by adding in two new node types, a function definition node and a call node. So class function definition node. So for this we want the var name token and that's the name of the function. And this might be none if the function is an anonymous function and it's not given a name. We then want a list of arg name tokens. So those will be all the names for the arguments. And then finally we want the body node which is to be evaluated when the function is called. So I've just gone ahead and assigned all these variables. And I've also added in the position start and position end. So if our function definition has a name, uh, we're setting the position start to that name's position start. If that's not the case, we're going to see if there are any arguments. And if that's true, then we will set the position start to the first argument's position start. But if there are no arguments, then we'll just use the body node for the position start. But anyways, now we're going to create the call node. So this is going to take in the node that we have to call. And then it's going to take in the list of arg nodes, which are the arguments which are being passed into this function. So I've just assigned these variables and I've also added in the position start and position end, uh, which is quite similar to above. So now that we have these nodes in place, we can update the parser to create these nodes. So we'll start inside the atom method and we now want to look for the function definition, uh, which means we have to look for a function keyword. So we'll add in that check at the end. So we'll change this to function and we'll change this to a function definition. So now we need to add in this new function definition method, so I'll add this down at the end here. So we'll start with a parse result as usual. And now we're just going to check here if there is no function keyword and then we create an error saying we expected a function. We then want to advance and go past the function keyword. And since our function could or could not have a name, we're going to check if there is an identifier and if there is, then that means it does have a name. So we'll assign var name token uh, to the current token. We'll advance. And after the variable name, we're expecting a left parenthesis, so we'll just add in this check. And if there is no left parenthesis, we'll create this error message. So if there is no variable name, uh, we're just going to set var name token equal to none. And then we again want to look for a left parenthesis. Uh, but this time, if we don't find one, we're expecting an identifier or a left parenthesis. So this is because we are in the else statement, so we didn't find an identifier. And we also didn't find a left parenthesis, uh, so either options are valid. So after that then we need to advance to pass the parentheses and then we need to create a new arg name tokens variable for all the argument names. So we need to check first if there is an identifier. So if the current token type is an identifier and all we have to do now is add that identifier to our arg name tokens array and then we just advance past the identifier. So after that we can have zero or more commas and identifiers so we'll add in that check. So we'll check while the current token type is a comma and then we'll advance past the comma. So after each comma, we're expecting another identifier, so we'll just add in this check for an identifier. But if we do find an identifier, then we just need to add that uh, to the list and advance. So once we're finished finding commas, we then want to look for a right parenthesis. And if we don't find one, we have to say we expected either a right parenthesis or a comma. So now we need to add in an else block, uh, which checks if we don't have an identifier at the start for our arguments. So if this is the case, we are expecting either an identifier or a right parenthesis. So after that, we advance past uh, the parenthesis. Then we want to look for an arrow, and if not, we show an error, and then we advance past the arrow. So now we need to look for the expression that the function is returning. So we'll call that no to return. And this is going to be equal to a new expression, and we will... I wrap that in result.register and we'll check if there's any errors. So if there are no errors, we'll return a new function definition node. And this is going to need the function name, which will be the var name token, the argument names, so that's the arg name tokens, and then finally the body of the function, which is the node to return. So now we need to add in the code for calling functions. So above the atom, we want to create a new function called call. And we also want to update power to look for a call instead of an atom, so we'll change that here. So we'll start with creating a new parse result, and then we want to look for an atom. So now we're going to see if there's any left parentheses, and if there is, that means we are calling the atom, uh, but otherwise we're just getting the value from the atom as before. So we'll check for a left parentheses, and then we just advance. So this means we are calling the atom, so we need to build up a list of arg nodes for the arguments being passed in. So we'll check if we immediately come across a right parentheses, and that means there's no arguments being passed in. 
Uh, but otherwise, we need to look for an expression for the argument and we'll append that to the arg nodes list. So now we need to check if there's an error when we looked for that expression. So we want the same error message uh, which we have for the expression, uh, but we also want to add right parentheses to the start, uh, because if we had a right parentheses instead, uh, then everything would have worked fine. So if you go over to the expression method, you can just copy and paste its error, and then what I did here is I just added in right parentheses to the start. So after that then we can have commas and more expressions for the rest of the arguments. So we'll just check while the current token type is a comma, and then we'll advance past the comma, and then we'll go ahead and look for another expression and add this to our list. So at the end then we're expecting a right parentheses, and we can advance past that right parentheses. So now we can return a new call node, and we can pass in the atom and the argument nodes. However, if we don't provide parentheses, we're not calling the atom, but instead we're just getting the value of the atom as before. So at the end, we can just return the atom directly. Okay, so that should be it for the parser, so we can now move on to the interpreter. So the first thing we have to do is add in a new function type to our language, because at the moment we only have a number type, and we now need a function type which we can call. So I've created this new value base class which all our types are going to inherit and I've moved the set position and set context functions into this base class. I've also added in all the operations we've had from before but uh, it just returns an illegal operation unless this method gets overridden. So I have an illegal operation method here at the end of the class. So now our number just inherits value so we don't need to repeat any of that in the number class. So since we have more than one type in our language now, it wouldn't make sense, for example, to add a number to a function. So for every operation in the number class, I just added in a, a, an else statement, and I just return an illegal operation error, which is this function again. So you can just get all these changes uh, in the link to GitHub in the description below. So now we're going to add in a new function value type. So we'll create a class called function, and this is going to inherit value. In the init method, we're going to take in the function name, uh, the body node, and the arg names. So we'll assign name to name, uh, but if it doesn't have a name, we'll just set the function name to anonymous. And then we also assign the body node and arg names. I forgot to mention that we added a new execute operation to the base value class, uh, so we can override that in the function, and this will be called whenever the function is executed. So this is going to have to take in the arguments uh, to be passed into this function. And we'll start by creating a runtime result. So to execute this function, we're going to need to use the interpreter. Uh, so I'll just create a new interpreter instance. And I really should have made the interpreter a static class, um, but I'm not bothered to change that now, so we'll just uh, create a new interpreter instance. So if you remember in the previous video, uh, every time we call a function, we want to create a brand new context with a brand new symbol table, uh, which gets destroyed when the function uh, returns. So we'll create a new context variable. Uh, the context name is just going to be our function name. The parent context is just going to be self.context, uh, which is a property that the base value class will have. So then we need to pass in the position of where this function is called, so we can just use self.position start. So we also create a new symbol table for this context. We also have to pass in the parent symbol table, so this will be our new context parent, and then we can get the symbol table from that parent context. So now we need to check that the number of arguments we passed in is correct. Uh, so I've just added in these two checks that looks at the length and says either too many args have been passed or too few args have been passed. So now we want to iterate over every arg. We'll get the argument name and the argument value. So for all the arguments passed in, we're going to have to update its context to our new context. And this is because we're going to be adding this value to our new symbol table of our new context. Uh, so we're setting the argument name to the argument value. So this means we can then access those arguments uh, inside the function definition. So now we're going to call interpreter.visit and we'll pass in the body node which we have to visit and we're also going to use our new context instead. We can then assign this result to value and we'll check for an error. If there's no error we can just return the value. So I've also just quickly added in a copy method which copies the function so it just creates a new function and passes in all the variables and sets the context and position of the new function and then just returns it. And I've also added in this representation method uh, so you can see this function string uh, when it's printed on the terminal. So now that we've added our new function type, uh, we can update the interpreter and create the visit function definition uh, nodes and function uh, call node methods. So we'll come over to the end of the interpreter and we'll create a new method, a visit function definition node. So this will take in the node and the context. So we'll start with our runtime result as usual. 
and then we'll grab the function name from the var name token of the function definition node and we get the value and this will be none if the function doesn't have a name and we'll also get the body node and then we'll get the argument names so we go through each argument name in the argument name tokens and we just get the value of each argument name so this will make it be a list of strings instead of a list of tokens so now we'll create a function value and that's going to be a new function and we can pass in the function name uh, the body node and then the argument names we also need to set the context of this function and the position as well so that will be node.position start and node.position end and we'll also check if the function has a name and if that's the case we want to add that function name with this function uh, value to the symbol table so then we can invoke the function with its name so finally at the end then we can just return the function value so the only method we have to do now is the call node so we'll just add that in uh, visit call node we'll take in the node and the context we'll create a runtime result again and we'll create this args list which is the list of args uh, we'll be passing into the function when we're calling it so if we visit the node to call then we, that should be a function definition node uh, so when we visit it we should get a function value and we can assign that here if a user tries to call a number for example it's just going to return an illegal operation error because that makes absolutely no sense so we'll check if there's any errors and what we're going to do is create a copy of the function value that we are calling and in this copy we can update the position to our call nodes position start and position end so this means if there's any errors it will show where we're calling it rather than where it has been defined so we now want to build up our list of argument values uh, so we'll go through each arg node in the arg nodes list and we'll just visit that arg node and we'll append it to our args list and we'll check if there's any errors so now we can execute what should be a function uh, with those args we'll wrap that in result.register and we'll assign the result to return value we'll check for errors again and then all we have to do is return the return value so we're almost finished uh, there's just something i forgot to do in previous episodes uh, so if you come into the atom method we have to include if for while and fun in the error message uh, so we'll just add that here to the end and since the expression method is overriding the atom error message we also have to add that in here and we also need to update the symbol table constructor uh, to take in an optional parent and we can assign self.parent uh, to that parent and finally in the visit function definition node method of the interpreter uh, we're assigning a function name to the node var name tokens value and we can only do this if it has a var name token uh, so we just add in this check if it has a var name token uh, but otherwise we'll just assign it to none all right so that's going to be it for this episode you can see the end result at the start of this video so i'm not going to go through it again so in the next episode we're going to be adding string values so it should be a bit of a shorter episode so thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed don't forget to leave a like and comment if you have any problems or questions and i will try to get back to you as soon as possible and i will see you all in the next episode